know, genre fans are incredibly loyal. They're optimistic. They'll give anything a try. They're the perfect market. Um, they're willing to try new things. They're, they're optimistic. They want it to be good. They're excitable. They're playful. They're all the things that we love in children, and yet somehow there's, there's my personal experience is that anything I'm interested or have been interested in as a child, an adult critical mind comes in and shuts it down and says it's not worthy. That's been a puzzle I've been dealing with my, my entire life. It's based on the uh, long-running uh, comic book by Robert Kirkman. It was created by Frank Darabont. It's executive produced by uh, Robert, uh, Gail Ann Hurd, uh, Dave Albert, and myself. And it's become a worldwide phenomenon. It's, it's shown in 122 countries. And um, as, as uh, Joel said, it's, it's a huge rating success. It's also becoming a bit of a cottage industry. We now have video games, action figures, figurines, board games, playing cards, stickers, that sort of stuff. So it's, it's really in the zeitgeist. It's hitting a nerve that audiences are, have an appetite for. And people ask me this question, and I have a theory that I'd like to pose today. Some of the theories that have been posed is that zombies are just, it's, it's basic good versus evil, they're a monster, they're very simple, but if you think about zombies, they're not particularly sexy, they're stupid, they have very little brain power, there's no mythology. Um, why would a lot of people want to watch that? Okay, um, there's been some, some um, sort of high-minded theories as to what zombies represent. Uh, one I've heard is that given the um, hard economic times, that uh, it represents the breakdown of class structure, that you don't have to uh, be a CEO or someone who's powerful to, to succeed. In fact, the skills of the uh, blue collar workers, the people who can work with their hands, that perhaps um, those are the people who would succeed in a zombie apocalypse, that the apocalypse is a great leveler. That only works so far. <laughs> you know, a lot of kids like this show, a lot of families sit down. There's a community aspect to this show of why it's a success. Um, people always say, hey, my kid loves zombies. They're sitting down. People are watching this in groups. I, I don't know if that really applies. Um, I've also heard that zombies uh, apply to younger people, that it's representative of information overload. It just keeps coming. I don't know. I don't buy that one either. So, so I'm going to pose my theory uh, later in this talk. As a showrunner, though, what I'd like to also set up in this talk is that I have three creative influences, three passions that I've had throughout my entire life that are coming together in this unique project. Comic books, TV, and horror films. And I'd like to talk about how I've encountered all of those, what, what they mean to me, and how um, it all comes together. I picked a clip, this clip's a little long, bear with me, but this really does show how my vision of the show is trying to draw all three of those elements together. So why don't we run the clip, and then I'll, I'll come back. Um, I first wanted to become a storyteller when I was a, a very, very young child. Actually, on my first day of school, I came home and my mom asked, what happened? I was like, I don't know. And she said, um, well, your brother and your sister always tell me what happened. So I proceeded to tell her every single thing that happened. <laughs> okay, so about two hours later, she said, okay, that's enough, that's enough, but... Uh, it, was, it was interesting that that's how I began, that I always wanted to tell stories to people, and I found this as a way of a very primitive need, a childish need for both expression and connection. Um, I was a weird kid, I'll admit that, and uh, some of the kids on the block uh, would not want to play with uh, my brother and me, and it was one time that I went down the block, <laughs> and uh, called on some friends, and they opened the door just to crack, and said, uh, go home, go home, we're making comic books. So I was like, well, what do you mean you're making comic books? And they explained what they were doing, they were making stories and drawing them out. So I went home and I started making comic books. So this was another way 
from telling stories that I was seeking, I think, some type of bond, some type of connection. So the, my interest in comic books really took off when I was a kid, and there were two fundamental comic books, two, two seminal comic books for me. Uh, one was X-Men, uh, written by Chris Claremont, particularly his Dark Phoenix, Phoenix saga. And here, what I took away, what I loved about this particular comic that I, I just read obsessively, was a sense of family, there was an ensemble cast, there was uh, people looking for a safe place, looking for acceptance. I think I'm drawing on those themes now in The Walking Dead. The other comic book that was seminal for me was Frank Miller's Daredevil, his Bullseye Electric Kingpin saga, which I absolutely loved. And what was important about this, this particular comic was even though the hero, the main hero, was running around in red tights and had uh, superpowers, it felt real to me. It felt real because it was grounded in a New York City that I grew up in. It was New York City that was shown in Cindy Lamette films. It was, um, you know, the, the New York City that Ford told to drop dead. It was uh, uh, urban decay. It was, it was a scary time in New York. This was pre-Giuliani, pre-Bloomberg, pre-Times um, Square as, as, a, a, as a safe place. It was not only about urban decay, it was something that was gritty. That's something that I think has been a huge influence in my, uh, on me as an artist, and something that um, uh, is an element of my writing. So even though I was interested in comic books, what was, um, I was told that comic books weren't good enough, that comic books were um, garbage. You know, you buy them in a drugstore, they're not particularly interesting, they're cheap, I think they were considered childish, they were pictorial, they were based in fantasy. And um, my family and, and people around me, teachers, um, did not think that comics were worthy of my time. I was actually told this several times. I think also some of this has to do with comics themselves. They are a, a little bit disposable. They're, they're, they originated from a, um, a type of pulp type publishing. And I would argue that it's not until the mid-80s when comic books were repackaged as graphic novels that they ended up somehow becoming a more legitimate art form. Okay, that, that, I, I don't want to get into a debate about this, but the, the comic book itself as a single issue started being reprinted, as far as I know, in mass paperbacks, and that became a graphic novel, and all of a sudden it was cool to read that. So, um, but that was not my... Um, um, uh, experience when I was younger. And so comics were actually a solitary pleasure for me. It was something that nobody else really, uh, of my friends and family were into. And I remember considering that they were childish, and I will admit, I sold my comic book collection in college to buy a 1971 VW bus that burst into flames and I abandoned it on the side of the road in New York, Massachusetts. So, that's what I get to sell them for my ex -Men. So, anyway, um, coming out of comic books, I did enjoy uh, uh, fantasy uh, material. I was a Lord of the Rings geek. I actually have read The Cimmerillion three times. Um, I loved uh, Conan the Barbarian, Edgar Rice Burroughs, fantasy, sci-fi, and uh, really, if you think about it, the only sci-fi, when I was a kid, the only sci-fi book that I read that was considered acceptable was 1984. But sci-fi, I was also told, was not good enough, that that was not legitimate, a, a, a legitimate, um, um, you know, pursuit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if we look at elements of sci-fi, I think that, you know, sci-fi, um, is really, uh, this is a definition that comes from Eric Rabkin at the University of Michigan. It's the fantastic made plausible against the background of science. There's an element here in The Walking Dead. High adventure and intellectual versus emotional excitement. So I think those things, that it's fantasy, that it's, it's high adventure, that, that there's something exciting about sci-fi, again, it did not, I was never told that that was a, a worthy adult pursuit. When I started writing in high school, I, um, uh, when I was a kid, I did write some sci-fi uh, short stories. Uh, I was interested in doing that. 
But my first uh, short story that I wrote with, felt like The Catcher in the Rye. It was kind of a wise-ass guy from Queens. It was, it was, it was uh, published in the high school uh, magazine. It was well-received. And then after that, I um, wrote a uh, Dashiell Hammett, Ray, Raymond Chandler style uh, short story that I gave to a teacher. I was very proud. And uh, he just said, this is horrible. This is not good. You need to go out. You need to read the Western canon, the great literature. But again, here are things that were my interests that when I presented them to adults in my world, this was, I was told that these were not worthy pursuits. Another um, um, uh, interest of mine was TV, okay? I, I'm a TV buff, I love TV, I grew up watching TV. I'm not really that much of a film guy, I'll admit that. My favorite TV show of all time was The Twilight Zone. I consider Rod Serling the greatest TV writer. I think he's a genius. Um, and if you look at The Twilight Zone, it's, it's getting a little more grounded. There, there's certainly science fiction elements. There's certainly a lot of fantasy. But somehow it feels more plausible. It's, it's, it's uh, perhaps because it feels socially relevant, because it's character-based dramas. Um, there was something that was interesting there. And I, as I look at my TV viewing habits when I was a kid, I see that because TV was a social media for me, meaning I watched it in the living room with my family, I couldn't really be a Star Trek guy. I couldn't really pursue fantasy TV. What I ended up doing was watching more grounded TV shows. Um, things like Hill Street Blues. I lo absolutely loved Hill Street Blues. Um, I remember there was an episode by uh, David Mamet in which Jeff Goldblum has to dig his own grave. That was pretty scary. I was lucky enough to work with Mamet and asked him about that. And he goes, hey, you like that? Okay, good. And, <laughs> and, um, and I, I remember really, really a seminal episode of TV was uh, David Milch's first episode of TV that he ever wrote, which was the Hill Street Blues third season premiere called Trial by Fury. Um, I mean, this guy hit the trifecta on this one. He won the uh, WGA award, the Humanitas award, and the the uh, Emmy. So there was no pressure when I started becoming a TV writer. You know. Um, anyway, it was a phenomenal episode of TV, and it really sat with me. One of the things that was interesting about that particular episode, or about that particular show, was it struck. Again, it felt. Uh, gritty to me. It felt realistic. It was about urban decay. It was it was uh, brutal. It was um, honest. It felt like the world around me. And I think it was also something about growing up in the late 70s and the early 80s when, when um, I was taking all of this material in. This was all in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And that war, you know, I didn't know anybody who went to war. I mean, my dad was in the Navy, but he was just you know, putting around in some motion somewhere. But but the the uh, uh, he didn't see combat. I mean, but but the the um, the the effect, the, the malaise that that the country had at that time, that it just felt like all the pressure was on. I could see that that is something that I've drawn upon um, in my work. Um, if you look at another one of my favorite shows, Mash, uh, that was certainly a groundbreaking experimental show. It was fearless. Um, there was there was also a scene in which Hawkeye uh, helped a Korean man dig a grave. It was a silent scene. You can see I'm going to have a lot of grave digging scenes in The Walking Dead coming up. <laughs> um, and if you look at that finale, I don't know if people remember that finale. I, I know it was. Uh, I think it's still the most watched uh, uh, show in history. I could be wrong about that, with the exception of Super Bowls. But if you look at um, that finale, what was what struck me, and I remember being, you know, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, lying on, a, on the couch watching this with my dad. Um, they're coming back from a, um, uh, a beach outing, and they're forced to pull over because there's an enemy patrol in the, in the uh, area. And there's a woman in the back of the bus, and she has a chicken on her lap, and the chicken is clucking. And the patrol's getting closer, and Hawkeye finally goes up to her and says, shut that damn chicken up. And she smothers the chicken, she chokes it. And this is told over a series of flashbacks, and finally they pull back, and it's her baby. And that, that was so powerful to me, that that's something that I draw upon a lot of times when I go to write. 
And what was interesting was during the Writers Guild strike, I worked with, I sat on a committee with Dan Wilcox, and he told me that when Jim Reynolds and Larry Gelbart went to Korea to do research for the show at the very beginning of the show before they started anything, they heard that story and they sat on it for 11 years. Because they knew that was the ending. So you could see that, that the idea of TV, you know, Vietnam being a TV war, that the idea of, of war, The Walking Dead is a war. And they're they're probably going to lose, you know, <laughs> a lot of these people. And so, so I see that what I try to do as a showrunner when I tell stories is to draw upon these influences to show that the, this group is taking it serious, that that they are traumatized, that there's a sense of loss, and a sense of heroism. One of the things that I think is very interesting and I'm proud about in The Walking Dead is that there is a tremendous sense of grief when one of our characters dies. You really feel it in the same way that you feel it when um, other characters on TV shows die. You, you feel like this is a part of, going back to earlier influences, of a part of the, your family, a part of this ensemble that we've grown to love, that that's something that's important. I'm very proud that we've been able to do that. So, excuse me. However, when I decided to be a TV writer, I was told TV was not good enough, okay? That, why don't I be a playwright? Why don't I be a film writer? They're cooler. Um, TV was considered cheap, it has a broad appeal, it's not real, it's disposable, you watch it, it goes away, um, it's cheesy. I think a lot of this has to do with the idea that TV does not really necessarily come out of film, it comes out of radio. It's used to push soap a lot of times. And, uh, and again, in the uh, uh, late 90s, when I started becoming a TV writer, there was a real bias against um, TV. However, if you look at the recent nominees for the uh, Television Critics uh, Awards, Game of Thrones, Homeland, Justified, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Good Life, and I'll even put in Walking Dead, because obviously it was just an oversight. They skipped this. <laughs> If you add that up, that is 92 hours of quality drama. That equals 46 films. Somebody please name me 46 films this year. Okay? If you add comedy to that, we have 63 hours of comedy. Film cannot compete, and yet there's a bias that somehow TV is, is not good enough. HBO's motto is it's not TV, it's HBO. FX says there is no box. Um, I have producers on my show that say it's like we're making a movie every week. <laughs> and many people tell me they haven't seen the show because they just don't watch TV. So again, something that I'm very passionate about is just seen as not making the grade. Um, I think a lot of this uh, changed in, uh, in, with uh, the, the um, uh, Quality cable, shows like The Sopranos, The Shield, The Wire. Um, what's interesting is that even with those shows, when people watch their shows, people still say it's not like TV, it's like Shakespeare, it's like Dickens, it's like a novel. Um, I don't buy that either. You know, I find that sort of insulting because if you, when you write a novel, if you write a shitty chapter, you can just delete it. If you write a, uh, a, a bad section, you can just throw that out. The problem is that with TV is actually more like comic books. If you create a bad issue or you create a bad episode, you can't get it back. It's out there in the world. This is unique to these art forms. So you're really out on a tightrope. I think that's, that's fascinating. I love that. Um, I will say that I think part of the reason that this, this considered novelization, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw on my comparison before, the thing I said before about graphic novels, comic books, had to become graphic novels to become cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, suggest that TV series had the invention of the DVD in a way legitimized TV as an art form. Because now somebody's paying 30, 40, 50 bucks for something that's gonna sit on their shelf. It's part of their collection. They can binge watch it. I myself binge watch shows like Breaking Bad or, or uh, Game of Thrones. 
and people can watch it. It's sort of like watching a, a, a uh, you're engaging it in the way that you would a novel at home. Um, so I, I would say that DVD collections in a way legitimized t uh, a type of TV. Um, let's talk about films for a little bit, influences that, that I've had, and uh, particularly horror films. Okay, as I've said, I've, I've loved the films of Sidney Lumet, that feels like the world that I grew up in. Uh, my favorite uh, film is Apocalypse Now, which some people actually consider a horror movie. I have to think about that. Um, but I do love horror films. Uh, Jaws, Exorcist, Alien, the first movie, uh, art movie I saw was American Werewolf in London. Scared the hell out of me. I was gonna call my mom to come pick me up. My friend and I uh, then walked out of the theater and for some reason, if you remember, the end of the movie takes place in an alley. For some odd reason, this bus stop was in front of an alley. <laughs> and the funeral home, so <laughs> I, I, I have not seen the movie since, I'll be honest, I, don't, I don't, can't watch it, so anyway. So you have a certain type of horror movie, you know, the horror movies that we all, you know, think are cool horror movies, Exorcist, Omen, Rosemary's Baby, Jaws, and then in the 80s when I'm, when I'm in high school, um, you know, this starts developing into Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Friday the 13th, that type of teen slasher movie which very quickly um, just becomes easily dismissible. Again, here's something that I love, horror films, and it starts getting dismissed as, as just simply, um, um, you know, cheap, cheap schlocky, uh, uh, and exceedingly violent. And also, um, if you think about the way that some horror films have developed, this becomes um, just about stimuli, the idea that we're having um, um, a lot of sequels, you know, um, Friday the 13th, 92, that kind of stuff. Um, what's interesting is that as I, I couldn't get anybody to go see horror movies with me. I ended up watching them uh, alone at home. Um, so it's sort of odd to watch movies with high numbers um, alone. It sort of feels like you're watching a type of porn. These two things collide in torture porn. And, and you can see that that when horror movies become associated with porn, the, the basis type of film there is, and I say like, I like horror movies, people scratch their head. So what's, what's interesting about horror movies, one of the things that I've been thinking about as I, I approach The Walking Dead, is, there, is, is a lot of these critiques are true, I'll give you that. There really isn't any emotional connection to characters in horror movies. We never cry when a character in a horror movie dies. We just go, oh, and we're on to the next one. You do cry when people die in, in The Walking Dead. I hope you do. So, so um, that's, I think, something that's unique to TV, not necessarily horror films. So if we look at these, these interests of mine, comic books, fantasy, sci-fi, TV, horror, well, take TV out of that, um, you get all of these things are lumped together in genre. If they, these fans are called genre fans. Uh, that's such a, a nebulous word. And these um, genre fans in themselves, and I don't mean to be insulting, but I, I do have a lot of discussions, um, they're looked down upon a lot of times. They're considered to be, you know, oh, it's just some guy in his mother's basement with a comic book collection. Um, that they're, they're, these people are considered somewhat immature, that there's an arrest of development, that these are childish, unworthy pursuits. Um, I, was, I would argue that, that that's not true at all. That, that, you know, genre fans are incredibly loyal. They're optimistic. They'll give anything a try. They're the perfect market. Um, they're willing to try new things. They're, they're optimistic. They want it to be good. They're excitable. They're playful. They're all the things that we love in children. And yet, somehow, there's, there's my personal experience is that anything I'm interested or have been interested in as a child, an adult critical mind comes in and shuts it down and says it's not worthy. That's been a puzzle I've been dealing with my, my entire life. Okay? So, one of the things that... Um, <laughs> so, one of the things that I've been thinking about as far as TV, comics, horror, is why are people so passionate about them? Why do they like them? And I would like to posit that a lot of people enjoy them because they feel like games. And a lot of the way I approach my job is through a particular type of game theory. 
Okay? Uh, a book that really changed my life was written by a professor that I had at NYU, a guy named James Cars. And this was just one of those teachers that everybody loved, and you would just take a lot of a lot of his classes, and people would minor in Cars actually. And he wrote a book called Finite and Infinite Games. And he defines these as this. A finite game is a game you play to win, very simple. It has fixed time, fixed rules, fixed amount of players, and you play it to win. An infinite game is a game you play in which every move, the purpose is to continue the play. You don't want that game to, to end. You want to continue. It's open-ended in the same way that TV series and comic books are when you're making them. That there are many players, those players agree that they can bring in more players from, from, the, um, from the sidelines. There are no boundaries, there are only horizons. And it's endless, there's no fixed time. So I would say that, the, the, that a lot of genre actually is, are, has a game feel to it. I think that that's important, that uh, most of the video games on the market are actually sci-fi games. Um, there are fantasy, a lot of role-playing games, um, uh, TV and comic books, every 10 minutes, really? Wow, holy shit, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to get to some, 10 minutes for me to talk and 10 minutes for the whole thing. Okay, all right, we want to get to some questions. Okay, here's what it comes down to. So, <laughs> all right. Here's the thing, when I'm making the show, every storyline has to open up the possibility, has to open up more possibility. I don't know if you can see in that clip, but they shoot this guy, and then all of a sudden zombies are coming over the hill. We're going forward into the next, the next uh, episode. Well, we have a move in which the next episode, Rick announces that everyone's infected. What's important is that many, many genre fans want to play the game of The Walking Dead. They want to know what are the rules. Do zombies swim? Can zombies poop? Uh, what does it mean that we're all infected? You know, they want these answers. And yet, they don't want an answer that ends the game. They don't want to know there's a virus in Washington that if we get everybody a shot, that the game ends. They want to keep playing. So I would say, oh, I had this cool thing I was going to say, but anyway. So, say it, right. say it. <laughs> I would say that, that as we enter into games with TVs, right, with, TV, uh, uh, with a TV show, that if that show does not pay off the game that we think we're playing, we don't feel that we're rewarded. If you look at particular finales, the finale of The Shield, in which Vic Mackey loses but gets to play again. It's a draw. That fits with that show. Sopranos, Lost, people did not feel that those endings were necessarily satisfying because they answered particular questions but didn't answer other questions that people thought that they were playing. They didn't answer, the, 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 the game wasn't summed up. So now, getting to Back to The Walking Dead, I feel that The Walking Dead is a success all around the world because it is the most basic childish game we can play. It is the game of chase. It is the game of I'm gonna get you, which is really just an advancement of peekaboo. And <laughs> <laughs> a great call. And in the first half of the season, we were a quality, of the second season, we were a quality character drama and Genre fans who are looking to play a game were frustrated, and I thought they just wanted a high body count. I thought they wanted more violence, more gore. <laughs> no, what they want is they want to play, come get me. And they want to play, I'm going to get you. They want to play tag. This is something that is rewarding. It is pleasurable. It is something that we all play as kids. Every kid wants to play it. We know it's worthy. We know that, uh, look at The Godfather. Uh, Don Corleone dies playing this game in the garden. And we all think that's a happy ending to him. <laughs> okay? So it's something that we all love. So I think that my role as the showrunner is, yeah, I gotta deliver everything on budget or whatever, but it's basically, I'm like the dungeon master in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm the main master, I'm the master, I'm the coach. And I'm here to say, like, look out, I'm gonna get you. <laughs>